Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa. I'm Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And today we're going to be looking at uh, some of the recent developments in Burundi, which is a country we haven't looked at in, in quite some time. Um, just to give you an overview of where I'm going to go with the initial presentation, I'm going to look at some of the internal developments, notably the referendum, um, talk about what's problematic about the new constitution, uh, the environment in which the referendum took place and what that tells us about where Burundi's uh, internal situation is today. Um, and I'm also going to look at some of the um, external dynamics, both in the region and then at the UN Security Council. And then finally, I'll do a very short um, analysis of what it could mean that Nkurun Ziza announced last Thursday that he wouldn't be standing for the presidency in 2020. And then hopefully we'll have a good discussion and question and answer period afterwards. So thank you. Um, obviously, um, since it was announced at the, in the middle of December 2017, the referendum on the new constitution in, the, in, the, in Burundi has been the primary political uh, event that people have focused on. Um, essentially, the key elements of this referendum and of the new constitution um, are s modifications to the executive, but also to the legislative, and of course a modification to the uh, term lengths, uh, which are now seven instead of five years. So the key changes uh, which were adopted by this uh, referendum um, on May 17th are that there is now one vice, uh, vice president in the country as opposed to two. That vice presidential position is essentially a symbolic one. Um, there is a prime minister um, uh, who will be obviously in charge of the, the government, um, but very much under the guidance of the uh, president um, who will be appointing also the prime minister. Another key change is that in Parliament you now need a simple majority to pass legislation, whereas under the constitution that had come out of the Arusha Accords, a two-thirds uh, um, two -thirds majority was required to pass legislature. And remember that the, the basic elements or the basic um, uh, philosophy of Arusha was to try and create checks and balances at all levels of government, um, both in terms of individual party power, but also, most importantly, in terms of ethnic ethnic uh, distribution of power. Um, and that is one of the other key elements of this new constitution, that it allows for the review of these quotas that had been built into Arusha, and that review can take place over the next five years in a context where, as I just mentioned, it will be much easier to pass legislation than it was prior to the constitutional change. Um, and finally, and this is one thing that of course everybody has been focused on, um, is the fact that mandates, presidential mandates, uh, term limits, sorry, ma presidential mandates have been extended from five to seven years, um, and they are, uh, it's a two-term limit. Now the concern about that, um, obviously, was that perhaps Nkurunziza would argue that uh, the new constitution, the fact that there was a new constitution, meant that it reset the clock on his time in office, and so that the 2020 election, he should be allowed to run again because um, it was under a new constitution. And that could have allowed him to stay in office until 2034. So that was one of the key concerns. I'll come back to that towards the end of the presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the, the balance in decision-making in the legislature now is, is no longer around um, in terms of the CNDD, FDD, which is the majority party in parliament, having to reach a two-thirds majority. It can now pass legislation much more easily. The balance of power between Hutu and Tutsi um, and different parties also in terms of the two, the arrangement that existed before with two vice presidents, that is also now gone. And there's also um, no longer the requirement to include parties in the legislature which um, reach above 5% in the legislative elections. And so that was a requirement by, uh, for example, which had allowed for the um, FNL, led by Agaton Roissa, to be part of the current legislature, and that too has been scrapped. So we have a, a, a very serious consolidation of power um, in, in, in progress here. In terms of the environment in the lead up to the referendum, and this is really a commentary more on the general political environment in Burundi, and just to, just to backtrack a little bit, 
The crisis in Burundi really started in 2015 um, when we became uh, aware of the fact that Nkurunziza was going to um, try and use the constitutional court to allow him to interpret that he was eligible for a third mandate. Now we know that that went ahead and we also know that that mobilized civil society and the Burundian population quite strongly. In the aftermath of those elections, much of civil society has moved into exile, has been forced to move into exile. There are almost no opposition parties in Burundi at the moment. The political opposition has been forced into exile. We've had large-scale human rights violations, disappearances, killings, harassment, arrest, arrests, um, and these have been documented by a variety of organizations. Uh, um, we've got Amnesty, the Human Rights Watch, but also the, the UN Human Rights Commission report. Um, and just as a reminder that by no means is the violence that preceded or the situation of uh, clamping down that preceded the referendum anything new. But the referendum, um, there was widespread intimidation, so there were some new elements to it in the sense that um, it was pretty clear to the CNDD FDD that they weren't going to win this referendum if they didn't manage the population. And so they chose to manage the population through violence and coercion. Um, using, uh, to a great extent, the Imbonera Kure, the CNDD FDD youth militia, and the security services, which intimidated people initially in the stages where we were registering people to vote, but then also around the actual uh, referendum date. Uh, people were um, not, it was not possible for people to register a protest vote by not participating. They were essentially pressured to participate in the process. Um, we had a number of irregularities during the actual voting period on May 17 where um, security services were in voting booths with the, um, with the voters themselves. Um, and this, of course, has been criticized by the international community and by um, many Burundian uh, actors. The um, government also cracked down on international media. So not only were um, very few, in fact, I, I can't think of any international journalists uh, accredited to cover the referendum, but the government also shut down access to the BBC and the Voice of America. Uh, ahead of that referendum. Um, what has been the response from the opposition since the initial uh, announcement of the referendum? And, and I just want to also add that the referendum is really a process uh, or a, a really an event um, that um, was led up to by the inter-Congolese dialogue, inter-Burundian dialogue, sorry, in Burundi, which was the parallel internal process that was heavily staged, managed by the Burundian government. So it's, it was by no means the, 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 the beginning of, of, of a campaign to change the constitution. This has very much been under discussion within Burundi with a very limited number of participants and without the participation of the opposition. Um, so Amizero Ya Abarundi, which is the uh, coalition um, opposition opposition coalition that is in the country and which is largely uh, um, composed of members of the FNL led by Rwasa, and Rwasa of course is in the country as well, it campaigned no for this uh, referendum, so it, it said vote no against this new constitution. Um, Ruwasa, who has had a very little space to pursue his political views and to represent his own political views, he's prevented from um, holding rallies and being in contact with his supporters, um, was further punished, if you will. His military guard was withdrawn, which of course in a, in a highly uh, insecure context like Burundi is very significant. And this was in part due to his um, uh, instructing um, the no campaign and also because he had criticized the, the process of the inter-Burundian dialogue. The Sinared, which is outside of the country, its position on this referendum was to simply say boycott it to the population. Um, I think I alluded to the fact that that was a very costly position to take for people. They were um, very much coerced into participating, so I, I don't think that that was necessarily a very effective um, uh, position. The um, Sinared and the FNL had had some meetings in January in uh, Kenya with an, there was an attempt to kind of unify the opposition. It's been one of the weaknesses uh, of the opposition that it has been quite divided um, and to adopt a common position on this, uh, this referendum and that ultimately didn't, didn't really uh, succeed. Now, the um, outcome of the referendum is that just over 70% of the participants voted in favor of the new constitution, and there was a participation rate of 96%. Um, I think that those are somewhat questionable figures, especially the particip high participation rate. 
um, but also, of course, the veracity of the outcome. This has been contested by the Amizero coalition, um, who requested, uh, who introduced a, a legal process with the Constitutional Court asking that the referendum be annulled. Um, and then last week, the Constitutional Court found that this legal process uh, was unfounded. And so there was no basis to annul the referendum, which essentially means that the referendum has been adopted and that in many, many of the aspects that I mentioned earlier will come into effect um, pretty much immediately. Um, now, um, to go, move out to the region, um, both with regards to the referendum, but also with regards to the external mediation uh, that has been attempting to find a solution to the Burundian problem. As we know, the East African community has been leading that process under a former Tanzanian president, Benjamin Mkapa. This has been going on for three years. Um, there have been many attempts to try and get everybody around the same table, um, and none of those have really been successful. Um, in a recent, uh, his, one of his recent reports to the East African community, Mkapa made it quite clear that the main obstacle was the government's refusal to sit down with the political opposition. The government has consistently said it won't sit down with an opposition that has an armed element, which is really uh, only one part of the opposition, certainly not necessarily the Sinared. And so it is just an obstructive position that it has chosen to take. Um, one can discuss whether they might be more willing to come to the table now that they've achieved one of their key objectives, which is to change the constitution and to fundamentally alter the way in which political power is distributed in Burundi, and that will remain to be seen. Um, but certainly, the East African heads of state are not happy with the Nkurunziza government um, and are, I think at this point, rather amenable to the idea that the African Union take over uh, the uh, mediation uh, role in, in Burundi at this point, although it will have to be, I think, an entirely new process um, with different objectives now. But that is likely to, to, to happen uh, at some time in, in 2018. Um, just also as an indication of where the region now stands, um, and, and let me just finish on the EAC, in fact, I just want to make one more point. I mean, the EAC um, could have done more to push Nkurunziza to come to the negotiating table. It could have exerted more leverage. I think one of the weaknesses of the region is that Burundi and the political crisis in Burundi and the economic crisis, which of course is having a huge impact on the Burundian population, does not in fact have a very detrimental effect on the region, um, economically or otherwise, and that that is really one of the reasons that no leverage was exerted, that there wasn't the emergence of a regional hegemon who chose to um, you know, throw their weight behind, behind the process, and I think that is an essential weakness um, so far. Now, um, the community of East Af uh, the COMESA summit and all the EAC members are members of COMESA, um, was meant to be held in Burundi, uh, this is something that had been under preparation for about a year. Um, you know, it is usually considered uh, an honor for a country to host that type of an event. Um, and at the very last minute, um, the um, Secretary General of Comesa uh, chose to move both the date and the venue. And so the um, summit will now be taking place in Lusaka instead of Bujumbura. Now, this was a very, very humiliating blow to the Burundian government. Um, the Burundian the capital, Bujumbura, there are signs all over the place um, welcoming Comesa delegates and, and really putting on a good show for this particular summit. Uh, the CNDD, FDD, the government had really wanted to showcase the stability of the country and, and use it as an opportunity to push back against those who say that there is a problem in Burundi. Um, the decision by Comesa to, to move it, I think, is very telling. Um, I think it is an indication of frustration with Nkurunziza, of frustration with the referendum, and also of some of the um, very personal aspects he's, he's chosen to pursue in the last few, in the last few months, which I'll, I'll come to in a minute. In terms of the um, UN uh, and what the UN can do, the UN has tried on a number of different occasions to, to, uh, to play a constructive role in the resolution of the situation in Burundi. It, it's never really uh, gained much momentum there. Um, one of the big problems is that the UN Security Council continues to be divided about Burundi, with Russia and China uh, generally arguing that various different uh, issues in Burundi are a question of sovereignty. 
uh, in particular on the question of the referendum, uh, um, Equatorial Guinea, which is one of the A3, also um, voted against any kind of a statement on the referendum um, issue. And so we have a divided Security Council at this point um, that isn't um, clear about what role it wants to take. Now, South Africa will be a member of the UN Security Council from January. And uh, we know that South Africa is an important player in Burundi, but has been very much um, behind, well, I wouldn't say behind the scenes, but hasn't played a very constructive role in the last uh, five years. Perhaps it, it will choose to, to use its position on the Security Council to change that policy. And then finally, um, I just want to highlight some of the, the things around, um, of course, Nkurunziza's surprise announcement um, that he wouldn't run in 2020, uh, which he made last week on Thursday when the new constitution was adopted. Um, and there are a variety of different views about what it means, and I think it's also early days to try and interpret this. One view is that he doesn't really mean it. It's something that he said uh, because he knows there's a lot of pressure on him, there's a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness with him, the COMESA summit withdrawal, those types of things, the EAC um, withdrawing from mediation and giving it to the AU, those are very strong signs that the region is frustrated with him. Um, so he may simply have wanted to diffuse that a little bit um, and say that, take himself out of the picture and, and he may well then decide in a year or two that in fact he really does intend to stand. So we have to question how serious, how real this, this, this statement is. The other view is that he was pressured from within his own party to, um, to, to make that announcement and that the party will hold him to it and will find someone else to take up the presidential campaign in the lead up to 2020. And that in fact, it is an indication of just how divided the CNDD, FDD is, the ruling party is about um, Nkurunziza and about the crisis. Um, now that of course, means that there are opportunities to try and um, move Burundi back to a situation of stability. Um, I think even if the view is that the CNDD has essentially weighed in and has said, you know, you need to get out of the picture, uh, that doesn't mean that, 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 that the ruling party also wants to uh, lose power. Um, there's a lot at stake for the CNDD, FDD, access to state roots resources and to the economy. Uh, what, what economic activities remain are very much captured by the state. Um, and so um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, just the last element that I want to raise, which I think probably also played a role um, if the CNDD really did pressure him, is, the, is, is, is Nkurunziza's religious zealotry. Uh, he's a Pentecostal minister. Um, he spends a lot of his time uh, in, in prayer meetings and proselytizing across the country. And he has really tried to, he's, he's blurred the lines between his religious uh, views and, and his role as president many, many times. I think that could be an element in, in his drop in popularity with his, in his own party. And then there's also been a, a move to impose his views on, on society, so a very socially conservative views, notably about um, marriage, um, even things like length of hair and school children. Um, one of the things that he introduced last year or earlier this year is that um, people are not allowed to live together if they're not married. Um, and I think that these are the kinds of things that, 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 that may be a bridge too far for um, the ruling party itself. So um, a lot to think about. Um, I think one last word on the implications of Nkurunziza's announcement is that we mustn't, re mustn't forget that Burundi today is the same as Burundi prior to that announcement. Um, what we need is a, a re-establishment of a free and fair political space, of free and fair um, campaigning possibilities. It's 2018, these elections are in two years. Um, those, you know, we need access to media, we need civil society to be able to, to function freely and to be able to come back and the opposition to be able to come back if Burundi is really to, to, to recover from this crisis. So by no means does the withdrawal of Nkurunziza, even if we choose to believe it, mean that all is going to be well in Burundi. Thank you very much.